Good morning, Valley Church. Good to see all of you today. So let me get another round of applause for the worship team. They just do such a great job every week. We are so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, you know, if, if you're here for the first time, thank you for coming to worship with us. You've picked a very good weekend to come. This is actually our offering weekend. And for the members here, we know what this is every year. We look forward to this time of year where we can give back uh, out of the bounty that God has given us. Uh, but if you're not familiar with it, that's okay. We, uh, we are a church that believes in giving, giving of our time, giving of our energy, giving of our resources. Uh, you may not know this, everyone here, the worship team, the audiovisual, the ushers, everyone here is volunteer. They're not getting paid. They, they, they give out of their, the love for God and what he's done in their lives. And so we just like to take time like this to, to really celebrate uh, the ability to give that we have here in America and ha have here at the Valley Church. We're actually taking up two offerings today, well, technically three. So that at the first half of the service right here, we're going to take up an offering for the missions offering. And this comes from a tradition that we find in the Bible. And if you want to turn your Bibles with me to Romans 15, Paul is taking up a collection for the, the Jerusalem church. This is Romans 15, verse 30. It says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by, the, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there, so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. And Paul was taking up an offering for the Jerusalem church because at the time they were experiencing famine and they were in dire need. And so he went around Asia collecting money from the churches there who were well off and brought it back to Jerusalem so they could continue to do the work of God and minister to those who were less fortunate than, than the rest of the disciples. And that's what we do today. The money we raise here goes to the churches in Central Asia, countries like Turkmenistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, countries that are predominantly Muslim, countries where it is illegal to practice Christianity, and some of our churches are underground. And so the money that we take up today for the missions offering goes to those churches to support them in their ministry of the work that they're doing over there. And so it's, it's our way to partake in that, even though we cannot be over there, uh, we can partake in, in their suffering by, by giving back to them. The other offering we're taking up right now is actually for Hope Worldwide. Uh, Hope is a great organization here, and I'm going to show you a video that gives a little bit of explanation of who Hope is, just in case you don't know. No one, no man, no woman, no child should have to live in a world of fear, insecurity, and terror. Hopelessness is said to be more destructive than any weapon on earth. Far too many of our fellow man are living in despair. This, my friend, should not be. You see, we know how to bring hope to every single person on earth. When you acknowledge each person's inherent dignity, respect their humanity, and bring kindness, you bring them hope. And we know that when people have hope, they have a future. When you bring hope into a community, it transforms them. It changes everything. To bring a person or a family or a whole region from a place of desperation to a place of hope, you have truly made a difference. When you bring hope to somebody, you don't just change their day. You have revolutionized their world and their worldview. You restore faith in humanity and revive the belief that there are still good people in this world. We believe in a world where every single person has hope for their life and sees a brighter future. We are committed to fighting for everyone to have this hope in their life. Through compassion, excellence, and integrity, we will restore hope worldwide. Good morning, church. Welcome to our 11 o'clock service. Let's thank our worship service, our worship team for doing a great job. Thank you, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is uh, Cesar Lopez. It's good to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving for our missions, as well as our hope, knowing that what we do here, we're trying to make a difference in this world because God made a difference in us. So before I start, can I ask you to do me a favor? Can you turn to the person next to you and just say, hey, welcome, good to see you, I'm glad you're here. Give them a shout out. Yeah. 
All right. Woo. Wow. Hey, Toast, today we continue our series uh, in a book. If you're here for the first time, we're going through a very special book. And what book are we studying, guys? Hebrews. Hebrews. We're studying Hebrews. And today I will be talking to you about the Cafe of Faith. And what I want to talk to you about today is a better faith. And I hope that today will help you because today we live in a world where faith can be misunderstood in so many different ways. There's so many misunderstood concepts about faith. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to give you a little pop quiz. Is that okay? Can I give you a pop quiz? Don't search on your phone. Uh, don't cheat on anyone next to you. But I'm going to ask you a question. The question I'm going to ask you is this. What is faith? All right? So I'm going to give you a couple of answers here. What is faith? Is faith dreaming big? Don't say, don't say it out loud. Is faith uh, imagining the impossible? Is faith living large? Or is faith confident in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see? What I'd like you to do right now is share with the person next to you which one is your answer. I know some of you are saying D, all of the above. You want to play safe. I know, I know. All right. All right. You guys ready? Okay. So for 100 points and all the free water and coffee you could have at the Valley Church, if you come before 11 a.m., how many of you chose confident what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see? Okay, there you go. Out of curiosity, how many of you said live in large? All right, okay, okay. All right. You know, here's the thing. True, it is the last one because that's what the Bible says. Now, here's the thing. When you understand that, that what the Bible says about faith, all the others are going to fall into play. You'll be able to dream big because you're going to dream God's dreams. You'll be able to imagine the impossible. What, you going to church? What, you living according to the Bible? What, you married? You faithful to one person? What, you're a parent? Yeah, you can imagine the impossible, and you will live large. Not large in the sense of what we see on TV, not live large in what we see on the movie screens, but live large because we follow a God that's pretty large. And that's what I hope for you to have today, that you would leave your understanding, the importance of what it means to have true biblical So if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, we'll be taking a lot of our scriptures, uh, our readings from Hebrews 11 and Genesis. Hebrews 11 is a fantastic chapter. It talks about the hall of faith, the heroes of faith, men and women who lived their life against the grain, against the status quo, only living it with the spirit of pleasing one audience that was God. And so many of them, they made a difference when yet when many people thought they were crazy and some even lost their lives. And the author says, I want to give you a, a, a snapshot picture of the legacies of these men and women. Because I know that you have the, the, you're discouraged with all the persecution that's going on. I know there's a temptation to drift away. I know there's a temptation of second thoughts on the first decision you made when you said Jesus is Lord. I know you've got all these pressures coming at you. But I'm hoping through this letter that you will understand through Jesus it is better. And you know what? Having a better faith makes a difference. And that's what he's trying to say. And that's what I'm hoping for you to understand today. What does it mean to have the right type of faith? When you look at Hebrews 11, 21 times, it says, by faith. By faith, how these men and women live. How do they approach their life? What were they doing? It was by faith. How did they make decisions? By faith. How did they make decisions where to live and where to go? By faith. How did they make decisions on what to say and what not to say? By faith. How did they make a decision to live and even to die? How? By faith. Can you say that with me? By faith. By faith. And, and that's what I want to break down to you today. There's so many people we could dive into. Woo, we could spend here for the next 72 hours. But what I'd like to do is go to the top of the class, if you don't mind. The top of the class of the Hall of Faith, and that's Cain and Abel. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You could turn on your Bible. You could read, share with someone next to you. You could look at the screen up here. And it says here, now faith is confidence we hope for and what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. 
So there you go. If you chose that answer, give yourself a pat on the back. You chose the right answer. The biblical answer is being, faith is being confident, not in yourself, but in what we hope for and assure about what we do not see. And he says in verse 2, this is what the ancients were commended for. In verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In verse 4, he says, by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did, by faith was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's no moss, that he's not here, that his life is still speaking to us today, though he passed on thousands of years ago. That's pretty powerful. That's legacy. That's faith. That's the kind of faith, a faith that not only changes your life, but it changes the lives around you and the generations after you. That's the kind of impact that Abel had. That's the kind of faith that God wants us to have because God is a God that's always working in his way to tell us, you and I, how much he loves you and I. And he wants a relationship. But we see right here something special about Abel, that he was compared to his bro. And it is that his offering, there's something different about that offering that he made compared to his brother Cain. They both had different offerings. And as we look here in Genesis, you, you'll, you'll talk about the offering, and there's so many different perspectives on the offering. The Bible doesn't say, was it a blood offering? The Bible doesn't say, was it really specifically a grain offering? And there's two different perspectives on it, and maybe there's more. That maybe it was a blood offering for the forgiveness of our sins. Maybe it's a grain offering, which was enough. And different patterns shows that there's a connection to both. But here's the point that I want us to understand is that the Bible says that Abel's offering was better. There's something different about that. Can I show you what it was? Look in Genesis chapter 4. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Easy to find. Chapter 4. What motivated Abel to offer his sacrifice? You see, Abel is not trying to please God by his work, nor by his religion, nor trying to seek acceptance. Abel saw something that Cain did not see, that I hope you and I can embrace that today. And I believe if we do, we will be able to be confident in whatever comes our way that we will be able to have the hope that no matter what challenges that's before us or around us, that we know that we are following a God that's working even when we don't see. Sometimes we feel like, I'll only, I'll only walk by faith if I could see what God is doing. If you could only walk by faith, only when you see God is doing, you could only follow God when you know he's doing something, you could see it, you don't need God. There's some areas in our lives that we may not understand right now. But if we have the trust in God, you know what? We'll be able to embrace that faith. That's not just a misunderstood concept, but real faith. Can I share with you that today? Can I share with you? Let's look in Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, we're going to look deeper here on what actually took place. What made Abel... What got him into the hall of faith? We see it right here. Right after the fall of man, right after God has given the consequences of their choice to disobey God, Adam was given his consequences. Eve was given his consequences. And they are moving on. And we see right here in chapter 4, Adam made love to his wife Eve. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. 
In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and the face, and his face was downcast. We see right here, Eve giving birth to Cain, and when you look at the meaning of Cain, Cain means to get. So she named her son to get, Cain, and right after that, she gave birth to Abel. Some people say that there were twins, but she says right here, with the help of the Lord. Now I know, I can't relate to this, mothers, but I, that's one thing I've learned as a husband, as a father, as a male, to never ever relate that I know what it's like to give birth. <laughs> and I already see the women giving me the look. <laughs> I don't know, but this is what Eve says, it was with the help of the Lord. Meaning that yes. there was something, if you look in chapter 3, that God said, it's going to be like this. So as she was going through this experience, she knew that there was, this was something that was set upon the Lord. And that's what she says right there. That with the help of the Lord, this is something that I know as a consequence, as the way of my actions, that I'm giving birth this way, but I know it was said of God. And then they grew up. They grew up, and Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. And we see at a time right now where there's an offering that's being made. As I mentioned before, there's different perspectives in the offering. There's definitely a lot of connections you can make to the blood sacrifice, as you see in chapter 3. When they went to God, realized Adam and Eve were naked. They had to kill an animal. An animal had to be killed to cover themselves. So there is a connection there. There's later on that it's explained about the blood sacrifice. And then there's some who say that it was just a grain sacrifice, which was fine enough. But here you got Abel bringing the fat portions and the firstborn as an offering to God. And here you got Cain bringing the grains of the ground to God. But the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that Abel's offering was better. What made it better? What made a difference? What was it that Abel saw that Cain did not see? Well, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 11, do you remember before we talked about Abel and 21 times it was mentioned by what? Can you say by faith? by faith? There was something about Abel that he did that was by faith. That Cain did not do with no faith. And even some argue that he wasn't even ready to give a sacrifice. But what was it that defined that faith? Think about it. He gave the fat portions. I mean, the best. And think about this. He gave a firstborn animal. What does that mean? That giving the firstborn, there's no guarantee that he's going to have more animals later on. But there was a trust that I'm going to give my firstborn. And what, whenever another animal comes along, I trust you, God. I'm going to give you my very best, because all I know that I have is from you. There was a trust. There was a faith. This is an amazing, because the sacrificing your firstborn animal, that does not guarantee that any others will follow. He wasn't certain, but he was confident. He was assured. So giving the firstborn is saying, I trust that the animal, the next one, even though I give my firstborn, I don't know. But you know what? I trust you, God. That's pretty powerful. By faith. But you know, it's interesting, as we see this dynamic play out, that though it was better, though it was by faith, you know what was being exposed on the other side? was Cain's heart. Look in 1 John chapter 3. 
In 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. You know, something was going on in the heart of Cain. And that's what the author, that's what the Bible is trying to show, is that there is something deeper that was going on in the heart of Cain, and our heart is so important. If you want to have the right type of faith, you got to have the right type of heart. You know, it's interesting. Some people say, and it's a question, can you be grateful and unfaithful at the same time? All I know is this, is that when you're grateful and you have more gratitude, the faith pretty much overflows. Because from the heart. And what we see here is that Cain's heart is being exposed. And God's trying to show that there is a difference in the heart, in Abel's heart and Cain's heart. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, Jesus points this out too. We'll go back to Genesis, but just keep your thumb there. And we'll go to, or your bookmark there. And it says right here, Matthew 25, verse 23 to 24. The heart is so important. And what we see is that Jesus says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Yeah. Wow! Jesus says right here, hey, you want to go through the rituals? You want to commemorate me? You want to present your offerings and your sacrifice? But if you got something in your heart towards someone else, leave your gift there and go have a conversation. Go talk, go resolve. Why is that? Because the heart is so important. You guys with me? And that's what we see in Cain and Abel is that Cain's heart was being exposed. Cain's heart was being brought to the light. And that's what Jesus said about you want to give the gift. You want to make sure your heart's right. So what does that mean is that God always checks out the giver before he checks out the gift. He wants to make sure the heart's there. He wants to make sure that what you give comes from the heart. And that's what he was showing, that Abel, it came from the heart. He had no problem. I'm going to give God the best. Because it all comes from God. It all belongs to him. Cain, for whatever reason, the Bible says that Abel's was better. And, and I say this because it's important, the heart. And that's shown throughout the Bible, King David. They wanted to have a king, and they saw someone more, more uh, with a better appearance, better accolades, and the presentation was great, on point. Man, that's our king. But that was different from what God had in plan. He had a little shepherd boy who had a lot of character, a lot of grit, and a lot of heart for God to be the chosen king. Matter of fact, he was known to be a man after God's own heart. God looks for a heart that is soft. God looks for a heart that is humble. God looks for a heart that wants to repent and do what's right before God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. You guys with me? Yeah. By faith. We want to have that kind of faith. We got to see why the author put on the very front Cain and Abel. He's trying to communicate to us, even though he's passed away, he's long gone, that there's a value in having the right faith by having the right type of heart. And right here, as we see in verse 6, in verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? What is he saying right there? I'm giving you a chance, bro. Hey, Cain, what's up? Why are you angry? 
Why are you looking down? Don't, don't you know if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? He was giving him a way out. He was giving him a chance. I'm grateful that God gives us chances. And I don't know about you, but I need a lot of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances. I hope I'm not alone. And that's what he's doing. He's giving him a way out. He's giving him a chance. And only if you do what's right. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain's heart wasn't in the right place. Cain didn't see what Abel saw. Maybe later on he realized that Abel's life was more blessed by God. Maybe he saw a peace, a joy. After giving his very best, how can you be so happy? Wouldn't you be afraid that you gave your very best? He saw something different. But what happened through all that is that God was trying to expose his own sinful nature, his sin. So what happens when sin in our life is exposed? There's two different responses. Can I share with you? One is, man, you're humble. You're humble. You're repentive. You say, wow, I didn't see that. Thank you. Please forgive me. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt God. I, I, gosh, I'm sorry. My bad. Or we can get hardened in our heart. We can get hardened in our heart to the point we get so numbed out that we don't know what's right or wrong anymore. Growing up, I said things. I said to myself, I will never do that. Woo! No ways. I will never. Ooh, man, that's bad. Growing up, hey, that's not that bad. Let me see. Get closer. <laughs> and then I ended up doing the same thing. And when I started doing the same thing, guess what? It wasn't as bad anymore from my perspective because I had to find a way to justify myself. It felt good, but it hurt. It hurt me and it hurt a lot of other people. And when you're living a life like that, what, what do you do is that you just try to justify yourself and you harden yourself. And, and see, that's where Cain was at. But see, his face was downcast. God was giving him a way out, but he was also telling him something else, that sin is powerful. That sin is like a crouching tiger, ready to pounce, like a snake that's ready to attack. That's what sin is like, that it crouches, it's, it, it hides, it's waiting, always waiting to oppose what good we have in our character and in our spirit. And that's what God is trying to say, is that it's there, ready to get you. You can't pretend it's not there. you got to rule it. you got to master it. It's more powerful than what you think. But what the tendency in all of us, and I can speak for myself, is this, is that we don't like to see the monster inside of us. We don't. You know, um, I love my life as a disciple, making Jesus Lord of my life. Um, when we lived in the Philippines, you got to understand, it's crazy there. I mean, to get from point A to point B is a task in and of itself. And there are times when I'm at the mercy of the taxi drivers. And when it rains, oh boy, just call me the slave. I need to get here. I need to get there. And at times, they would take advantage of it. I don't know if it was my English accent. But for whatever reason, I had a bad attitude toward taxi drivers in Manila. And I would sin, literally. I would ask them, Makano, how much? Saan? And I'm smiling. And then they'll inflate it by 10 times or 100 times. I don't know, some number. I said, bucket. Why? Boss, help me out. Just right. And I would slam the door, and they would get more mad. 
There's one time one taxi tried to run me over. And to me, it was uh, that's life. And I remember going to a uh, time with uh, Preston and Sandy Shepherd. We we're in a discipling relationship with them. They're helping us and training us in marriage, ministry. Love them. And I went to him, I said, oh, press man, I got to just share something with you, you know. <sighs> Blue today, had a fit of rage. I said this and that, and this is what happened, and just want to keep in the light, and um, yeah. And then he looked at me and said, Cesar, you, do, you did that? You're such a happy guy. I would never imagine you'd like that. And I said, yeah, I know, it's, it's, the, it's the humidity. It's the uh, <laughs> humidity, it's the peso, it drops, it goes high, you know, it's all these different factors. And then she, he turned to Jennifer and said, Jennifer, is Cesar always like this? And she said, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, just like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> And I said, honey, don't throw me under the bus here, baby. And then he said, I'm very concerned for you. Because your anger is going to destroy your faith. And, you know, I tried to, I tried to justify it by saying, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little thing. I'll get over it. Um, I'm over it by tomorrow. I'll be okay. But sometimes we try to think we could just get over it. Short time. How long does an earthquake take? How long does it take to launch a nuclear bomb? How long does it take for a bullet to end a life? I got thinking. I said, man, there's something wrong with me. And I heard what he had to say. I heard what Jennifer had to say and convicted me. But you know what convicted me the most is that I wasn't allowing the word of God to cut my heart anymore and move my heart. So I did a thorough study in the Bible about fits of rage. I did a thorough study about bad anger, unrighteous anger. And you know what? It convicted me. I repented, I apologized to Jennifer, to other people, and you know who became my good friends? The taxi drivers of Manila. <laughs> I would go in there, ask them for a ride, and they're trying to take advantage of me. I would just smile, and I'd look at Jennifer and just give a wink. No problem, boss. Whatever you want to charge. And I say that to you because that sin is always crouching behind me, waiting. You know, in, in Cambodia, you got to be careful where you walk because of the landmines. I know they cleared a lot of landmines, but there's still a lot of landmines out there. But you know what's more scary to me? The cobra snakes. Excuse me. The king cobra snakes. They're not regular cobra. They're king cobra snakes. I mean, there's a cobra snake, and there's a king cobra snake. And let me tell you, when you see a king cobra snake, that's why they call them king. But there's something about the king cobra snake when they get in their position, and they're like this. You know? And they're looking at you. They're not, they're not wanting to dance with you. They're crouching. They're ready to pounce. In Cambodia, you know what they do to deal with that kind of problem? You know what the brothers there in the church do? They eat them. <laughs> they do. It's funny. But what I'm saying is this. What God was telling Cain is this. Sin is powerful, man. I'm trying to help you get a way out. Sin is like an animal, the one animal that's going to pounce on you. And see, that's how it is for many of us today. When we play with pornography and try to justify it, we're basically looking at a tiger that's ready to attack us. When we deal with undealt anger, and we think that being a walking time bomb 
is just who I am, you, you don't realize that you, you got a cobra snake that's ready to pounce on you. And let me ask you a question. Would you go to sleep in bed with a wild tiger? Would you go to bed and, with a, 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 a king cobra snake? No. And see, that's what God was trying to tell Cain here. But Cain, it's got at the point where he said, it's not a big deal. Because that's the tendency of what we tend to do at times is that minimize our sin on what's going on in our lives and say it's not a big deal. Why am I saying this to you? Because if we want to have the right type of faith that's in season and out of season, that's rich and strong, whether we have money in our pocket or we don't have money at all, when things go well and things don't go well, there's a type of faith that God is calling us to have that Abel is screaming from his, his deathbed saying, hey, guys, 2019, this is the kind of faith. And when we do have that kind of faith by realizing the importance of dealing with the junk in our lives and having the right kind of heart, we too can have some sort of legacy. But what we see right here is that Cain, at some point, some point, did not value God the way Abel valued God. Can I give you an analogy? I see a lot of it nowadays. You know, when people are proposing to people, you know, I mean, man, it's crazy. I mean, nowadays, I mean, you ask someone to, to homecoming, it's a big thing. You know, uh, you ask someone to the prom, it's a big thing. And, you know, the, the teens nowadays, man, they go all out. It's cool. I mean, back in the days, I just wrote a paper. Would you go with me? Here's the box. X or, yes or no? <laughs> you know, I said, hey, come a long way now. But can you imagine this? A guy who's in love with his girlfriend. They're so fired up. And you know that marriage is somewhere within the vicinity. So what does he do? He goes and buy a nice ring. And he sets it up. Nice place, beautiful place, good scene, good ambiance. She has no idea what's going on. Maybe just a slight. Just a slight hint. Because every date is now a hint. So as they're walking, and she walks a little further, she notices he's not there anymore. And he, she turns around. And he's on one knee. And he's looking at her eyes. <laughs> and it's, everything goes slow motion. I can't believe it's happening now. No, this isn't. It's supposed to be, I was supposed to be wearing this on this day. I didn't, I didn't know it was going to happen. But <gasps> and then he said, you know, we've been in our relationship for a long time. And I've been praying that we could take it to another level. Will you be my rib? Will you be my wife? Will you marry me? And she said, yes, of course. And she's crying and the tears are flowing. And she's hugging him and he's so happy. And she says, finally, I've been waiting. He's happy. And then he says, thank you so much. The reason why is because I asked two other women the same question today. Man, you want to see a ring fly? And a guy fly? But see, that's what Cain, that's where his relationship with God got to. He got to a point that I'll be devoted to you. But he got to a point that I won't give you the best because you're no longer the best. You're no longer number one. 
And see, that's what God was trying to communicate. Abel had the attitude of devotion and heart for him. Cain did not. So what do we see right here? You know what the real problem was? Is that Cain gave what he wanted, not what God was worthy of. He only gave what he felt he needed to give, but no longer giving to a God who was worthy of everything. You know, as I read about Cain, and I don't know about you, but I'll be honest, sometimes I could feel a little Cain in my life. And I hope that you, too, can realize that we do all have blind spots. That we can get to the point, I'll only give what I want to give versus what God is so worthy of. And God is so worthy of everything. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, you guys with me? Yeah. Is this helping you guys out? Yeah. We're talking about getting a type of faith. And it's a beautiful thing when we have that type of faith. But we also got to look and see what's going to take not to have that kind of faith. What can stop us from having that type of faith? And in verse 8, it says, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out in the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain, so hard-hearted, didn't listen to God, didn't respond to the second or third chances, took matters in his own hand and said, bro, little bro, let's go on the field. I got something to show you. I want to talk to you about something. And what does he do? He takes his own brother out. He kills his brother. The Bible says right here that God says, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Some scholars, some commentaries, what they said was, at that point, what, he's, what he meant is that what Cain did to Abel, he turned him into a human sacrifice. He opened him up. He cut him. He said, now you want a sacrifice? This is a sacrifice. And it's very sobering, it's very humbling, that's very scary. And it's what we see right here later on that Cain is punished by God. He receives consequences on his sin. And this is important for us because what we see from here, in order to have that faith of Abel, to make sure we don't have that Cain-like heart, we got to have godly people in our life that really knows who we really are. We got to have. You got to have people in our lives. And I'm grateful for the men and women that God has put in our lives. They didn't say, many times they said things that was very hurtful and challenging but at the time, but I look back and I say, I'm grateful that God put them in our lives. And and I say this to you because we all have blind spots. Don't live your life alone thinking that everything is always okay by your definition. You got to have people in your life that know you. That's why we have a church. Our church, we're involved in each other's life. It's, it's more than just Sundays, just coming together. And honestly, Sundays are great. You hear great music, get some lessons, great fellowship, but... That's your time of connection. It's hard to go deeper. That's why we have these opportunities where our ministries can go a lot deeper in safe places with other men and women that's going through challenges as you, like what you are going through. And here what I'm trying to tell you is that you are not alone. You are not alone. And I want you to understand it's important to have these people in our lives. Discipling relationships are built on Jesus. And if you don't have that, you can have it today. And here's the thing. Even people without Christian faith, they'll tell you this, that anything that masters you can destroy you. They'll tell you that. I, I know people today, they don't believe in Christianity, but they'll know that anything that's controlling their lives, the vices, it's going to destroy them. 
And today, you got to be aware, whatever's crouching around you, that you've got to master it. You can't just say, oh, nice tiger or nice king cobra. <laughs> no. God says it's powerful and you must master it. You got to master it. And it's very possible. And I could let you know today that I'm still, I still have anger, but I still have the opportunity to master it. And, and I say this to you because to live by faith, we got to be able to have that type of joy like Abel. To live by faith is very doable, but you got to want it. Whatever age you are, you got to want it. To live by faith will not only change your life, but change the lives around you. And you know, it's such a great joy when you live by that kind of faith, where you give because you know that God is worthy. Like the missions today, thank you for all that you give. So, this ministry is so known to have that kind of heart, and, and thank you. If you're visiting here today, it's a great family. We really encourage you to come back. You look at the singers. I mean, you think they just, just wake up and come here and start singing. Oh, no. They come here Thursday nights, and they practice for hours because they want to give their very best. You look at the ushers been here for a long time. The people back there, you probably don't see them, but they're back in a room controlling the PowerPoints. The kids, what I'm just saying, and you're, you've done it too. What I'm just saying is that there's a joy when we become the givers that God wants us to become versus the takers that are out there. And when we give from that type of heart, God will be pleased. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm celebrating um, our wedding anniversary. Yeah, yeah. It's a, no, 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 no. No, 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 please, please, please. No, 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 no. Um, and, and uh, you know, some people say that, you know, when Tita Jerry comes up here, they, they say that um, he's going to show pictures of his family. People say, when I come up here, I'm going to share something about my wife. And um, I'm humble. I'm humble. We uh, celebrated yesterday, and uh, it's interesting because we're not going to celebrate it this week because we have no more money. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're going to have a Filipino filet mignon and a yakisoba. You know what that is? Spam and top ramen. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. I, I feel no, I feel, I don't even feel bad at all because I love giving to missions. I wouldn't be here if someone didn't sacrifice years ago to move out of their comfort zone to come help build a church in LA. I'm indebted. I know what it's like to be a missionary. And um, I say that because there's such a joy when you live like that. The joy of being broke for a good reason. <laughs> You know, the fellowship of the nada. <laughs> because you gave it all. I love helping people study the Bible. Whether they respond or not, that's beyond me. That's up to them and God. Some do, some don't. But you know what? Wow, to give. You know, we were, last minute we were asked to help out at a funeral yesterday. It's sad to see good man go but man the opportunity to go there and, and to be there for the family and to get, wow you know you're going to have hugs today that we live in a world where people don't get a hug in a year we, when you live a life because we have been given so much from a god who's given us but you know what yeah no wonder you could be confident because no longer is your, your security is what we have in this world or what we, how much money we have in the bank or not. It's by something bigger. Can I share with you some situations here? 
So we close out here soon. Let me show this to you. Here's a picture of, um, of some plants. That's our area where we help the churches in. And you saw the brothers, right? Well, you see those nice plants there. They're actually plants that are created by Claudia Smith. Claudia Smith can start her own come see Claudia, Claudia Flora shop. <laughs> but what she does is that she makes these decorations, these plants, and she sells them for a special missions contribution so the funds can go to help out the church there. Believe me, I could not even, I can't even, I don't even know how to fit anything in a pumpkin. <laughs> but man, the heart and, and the, the, the ability to do something like that, that's someone living by faith. It's amazing. Can I show something else to you? Hope Worldwide. This is an area in the Philippines. We heard that there's a mudslide that killed thousands of people. We went down there. Because you got to understand, when you have natural disasters like that, you have those who are in human trafficking, that this is an opportunity for them. Because kids are separated from their parents. And they pretend to be nonprofits. And they end up getting kids. So we go there. And when we went there, it was so intense because there was a school that was celebrating a day for moms. The fathers are in the, in the farm. All the moms come in. That school was buried. When the tractor got there to dig up the dirt and make the first scoop, you know what they found? Was the top of the flagpole. They couldn't get to them. People who've been buried in mud, bloodshot eyes, in shock. Kids couldn't find their parents. All they said that all they remember was the animals were moving first. Stuff like that, when things like that, animals move first, and that's what they're saying. There was a warning, animals move first, and all of a sudden, I was buried alive. Your contribution in, in, in hope allows situations to help people in these kind of disasters. You know, praise God, we got a church there now. Praise God, we're having more efforts in that area. See, when we give understanding this, we live by faith, right? So thank you again for all that you do there. Can I show you one last thing? Just recently, we had these young men, great men of God, from Moscow and Central Asia. They had a chance to go around Hollywood, and uh, Sasha Soy, back in his hometown, they call him Bruce Lee. <laughs> so he found a star, Bruce Lee. And you know what he did when he found that star? He laid on the ground. And he was enjoying it. This is his first time in America. He didn't care. He was laying on the ground, rolling around. People thought he was a little off, but he loved it. He leads a church that's underground, meaning it's illegal. He was preaching one time, and he got up, and he decided to share about the anger in his life and how he was so convicted and apologetic. There was a minister there who rents out the facility to them. And he said, oh, no, he's going to get fired for being so open. Afterward, all he saw was his congregation come and just give him a hug. And he came up to him and said, how did you do that without being fired? How did I do what? You were so open and real. That's who we are. So you know what he did? Can I meet with you? Because I want to talk to you about my anger. And you know what he did after that? He got his whole staff to meet with him and arrange appointments to deal with his anger. And how do you be vulnerable to your own church? Our mission goes to help situations like that. That's living by faith. So I say this to you today. Dream big. Imagine the impossible, live in large. Hey, those are good. But you know what's even better? 
is when you have hope and confidence in something and assurance of what we don't see. And there's a lot we don't see yet that God's not showing us, but we got to believe that there's God there. And how do we do that? By having the faith to give God not what we want, but who he's worthy of. And because of that, not only will our lives will change, but the lives around us. Amen? Amen. Helpful? Thank you. Let's pray for our communion. You're a good God. Who are we to come before you and even just partake in the breaking of bread and the fruit of the wine, the vine? We're humbled by this opportunity to commune with you as we reflect in your scriptures. As we look at the areas that sin may crouch in our lives, we're thankful that we have the victory because of what Jesus did for us at the cross. And because of that resurrection, we can be confident and have the hope of what we don't see yet. Thank you, God, for loving us in your special way. It's Christ that we pray.